Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building. Our guests are filmmaker Harvey Hubble V and actor Bruce Katzman. Director, writer, producer, Harvey Hubble V loves to make documentaries, which can be seen by the more than 50 awards and four Emmys he's collected. He lives in Connecticut, where he was the 2001 uh, Connecticut Filmmaker of the Year, and he He's been appointed to the uh, Connecticut Film Commission Culture and Tur Tourism, uh, as well as the Film Committee, right? Yep. All those. Uh, I love that you say you have to support your documentaries by making commercial films. Is that still true? Well, now we're, um, yeah, well, it's by any means necessary, really. So. so what kind of commercial films have you made? Well, I've had the privilege of... Um, working on all kinds of different uh, TV, commercials, uh, independent films, as well as feature films. Uh, lately, all we're doing now is uh, working on documentaries and mostly working on the sex of the movie. The, the movies, the documentaries are great. You've done documentaries in Peru and Warsaw. Tell me about the Warsaw one. Well, um, Thaddeus Kosciuszko um, was a Polish patriot who uh, worked with Thomas, um, Thomas Jefferson and actually uh, the Kosciuszko Bridge is really? named after him and he actually um, did, he came to America, built West Point and he came over with uh, a European uh, war, war college. So, so we spent a year working on that film, it's a wonderful film. Wow, Were you, did you do it all in Poland? Nope. Well we actually, um, I worked on it with my father, and uh, my father, who was a wonderful soul, um, made a balloon for Thaddeus Kosciuszko. So we ended up flying balloons um, oh. behind the Iron Curtain, great time, and a big mission of, uh, of humanity, just showing that these two cultures had so much in common. So that was Mr. Hubble the fourth. Fourth. What was Mr. Hubble the third? Mr. Hubble the third uh, was a businessman who. Um, who worked with his father, which was um, the second. Which was the second. <laughs> who and they were they were uh, inventors and oh. um, uh, he invented the wall socket, the pull chain socket. Really, not the Hubble telescope. Well, you have to go back further into the family too to trace where Edwin Hubble comes. Um, basically, not to bore you, but not but, boring because I thought about that. I thought the Hubble telescope is fantastic, isn't it? It's. <laughs> Pretty, pretty. But I like the pull light. chain on a t on a light too. Yep, that's not bad. It's no. illuminating, right? It all works. <laughs> it all works. Well, you've gotten so many awards, Harvey, that you you've just about given up everything else except maybe your film commission work and um, and you mentioned Warsaw. What about Peru? You worked on a banana boat. Did a yeah, story we shot, there. Yeah, we just shot we shot some footage when we were down there. Um, that wasn't into a documentary, but we spent some. Oh, was that was that? It? And then what about Loop Dreams? Uh, Loop Dreams was why do people make independent films? Is that right? That's true. I was thinking of Hoop Dreams. <laughs> well, we kind of took the name from that, which is the story of following uh, people who are following their passion. So when we followed uh, filmmakers, uh -huh. why would they go through all of this work? Um, and it's their passion. So we won. We won. Uh, I believe we won three Emmys for that. That's fantastic. That's what I said. You've got all these documentaries going for yourself, and you've got all these awards going, and now um, you're doing Dyslexia, which is another award. It's gotten awards in all these festivals that it's been in. 
how different is this from any of your other ones? Other people, maybe the other ones you were dealing with people who weren't alive. These people are alive and well, it has a message. Well, the message is, is very important and we realized once we started working on a film like this and the caliber of people we started working with, um, we started working with uh, Barbara Corcoran and Joey Pants, um, uh, Billy Banks is going to be with us at the, oh. at the premiere in, at Lemney uh, on, on Friday night. All right. um, you know, Billy Bob Thornton, all of these people struggled in school as dyslexics. And, and uh, we've just done some radio stuff where people will be calling in and, and they say, I've been, I've been struggling with dyslexia and, and how do I help my child? How do I do this? Uh, how do I get through to the school? Well, when we started working on this project, which would create awareness, we realized how big and how important this was. One, why, in, one in five people are dyslexic. But why did you choose dyslexia? I was born dyslexic, and uh, I'm planning on retiring dyslexic. Did you know it all the time you were a child? Oh yeah, there's, you know when you're dyslexic. And, do you um, tell people? Do they you know? know? I, now I walk around with a postcard. <laughs> that that I'm anyway. dyslexic. Yeah. But do you tell people? I, I think a lot of people, when I was growing up in the, in the 1960s, 1970s, people didn't know what dyslexia was, and they still they still don't. You're reversing letters. Exactly. So and that's it. So tell us what it is, because I always thought it was reversing letters until I saw your film. It's um, a speech language problem, dis meaning not so much, lexia meaning language. One way or another, there's a language-based problem in the brain. And we, we've talked about the idea that if you, don't, if you can't read and you struggle with language, that's going to affect your entire school right, career, right. and it's going to affect your self-esteem. So, and, and, and the, the point is, is we can identify it we can, we can work with, the, uh, you can identify it early and then you can start working with children to give them compensating mechanisms where they can read as well as anyone else in some cases. So wait, this film, I don't know of your other films, but in this film you put yourself in it. You were like kind of the interviewer, um, you were giving your opinions on well, things. I, I find myself easy to work with and I'm usually, <laughs> usually available when I need to be there. So you can so, do it? Yeah, it's, what, what about um, some of the um, tricks, not really tricks, but some of the filmmaking, you use animation, you use graphs? Well, you know, I believe that in, in documentaries are, um, you have these mountaintops. Like we ask everybody, what is dyslexia? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, we do man on the streets, ask what is dyslexia? I don't and know, I don't know. They kept giving you different well, ideas. They're telling us it's uh, eating right. disorder, it's right. a sexual transmitted disease. So. So in the beginning, the audience realizes they don't, they don't feel that bad. They say, I don't know about dyslexia. I don't know very much because they start seeing me in the streets. And then as we go throughout the whole entire film, we place these down where, where eventually we have a uh, Native American shaman coming in and saying, hey, you know, people, people would come up. To, you know, these people were sacred people in our, in our day. They'd come uh -huh. up and they'd shake hands with the wrong hand. You know, when they, when they meet you, they say goodbye. And when they walk away, they say hello. So it's, it's just this, this whole mind being kind of wired in a very different way. So we took people through those kind of journeys. Now just one other thing is when we would do interviews with people, um, what is your cutaway of dyslexia? So what, what we would do, and people struggling with school, we wanted to base the film to look like the old educational films of the 1940s and 1950s. To get that, to, get that yeah. to color and that feeling. Just dyslexia the movie. Yes. So, so we were able to then use all of our cutaways, we're going to be old stock footage of, oh, and, of people telling their stories. Yes, and also charts, right? Did you use animation? We use animation. We had, one of the things to understand is, um, is when they started studying dyslexia, uh, how, they, how they came about studying, um, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Samuel Orton, and he met uh, an educator by the name of uh, Anna Gillingham, um, how they all came together and all this information, where they get the information from, we wanted to tell that story uh, and make it entertaining. Yes, that's the thing. If you're watching a documentary, it has to be entertaining too, as well as educational. Do you use music? We use, I love music. And, uh, <laughs> so you I, use I music? Hear, I hear, matter of fact, Michael Bacon did a lot of music for us uh, from a very uh, wonderful dyslexic family. I, I had um, dinner with Michael the other day. Um, the music is a very important part of how people are going to feel. But one of the things that, that um, at the Chicago uh, Review, sort of about the, the guy who writes for Ebert, 
wrote that this is one of the films that you come out of the theater smarter than you were when you went in. Well, you're smarter, but you also know that there's some way you can help. Sure. That's the thing that's good. The special school you talk about, um, which is but where... It, does, it doesn't even have to be a special school. Do you realize that um, it doesn't cost anything to be kind? It doesn't... <laughs> I know, I agree. It doesn't cost anything to, um, to advocate and to help uh, a, a kid struggling. And, and of course, you know, this affects adults whose self-esteem went into a toilet because of their, their childhood. But, but the finding the gift of a child is so important and it's so easy to find out what every, every person has as their, their special, unique, you know, the dyslexic superpower or the regular power. You don't have to be dyslexic. Right. So, so you talk about superpower. You talk about Billy Bob Thornton, super super actor. How did you get him to to answer your questions? Um, you know, yeah. How are you get him? Once once you once you're talking to him, he's going to tell you the struggles that he had in school. Uh huh. And but how did you did you you had a list of people? Oh yeah. Obviously, that you wanted to get to. Right, and then uh, then some of them are gracious enough and very busy people. Gracious enough to be able to sit down and, and but they will enjoy talking about their childhood and what oh, happened. Right. To them. Here's the thing about Billy Bob Thornton. A wonderful, a wonderful story, is that he uh, he had two teachers in his life, and one teacher he you know he re remembers her for the negative things she did, but one teacher was the first one who let him act and do do theater, and see how that made a difference in that person's life. And here's my favorite part: Billy Bob Thornton. Uh, is dyslexic. He has a hard time reading. Um, doesn't really like. I mean, he he doesn't really like writing. He writes it with pencil and and a notebook. Um, but he won an Academy Award for writing. That's pretty cool. That's very good. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, and good luck on dyslexia. Thanks for coming. Thank we'll be right back with Bruce Katzman. to the Joan Quinn Profiles. As you know, we're taping at the Hollywood Museum in the famous Max Factor building. I'm here with actor Bruce Katzman, who graduated from Ithaca College and earned uh, an MFA at the Yale School of Drama. You've seen him in recurring roles in many TV series, guesting on network shows, and on the big screen. He's been acting in plays from New York to L.A. You were in cabaret. Mm -hmm. Do you sing? I sing, yes. You do sing? I've been studying <laughs> voice for 40 years. Every now and then, someone gives me a chance to sing. In fact, I was in a singing version of The Merchant of Venice last year with the Classical Theater Lab. Tony Tanner wrote and directed it. We did it outdoors in the summer. Oh, it was that's called good. Something of Silver. It was The Merchant of Venice, and I played Antonio the Merchant oh. and had a chance to sing. So you got to sing. Um, of course, Cabaret comes from those, that classic Berlin story of Christopher, Christopher Isherwood. Isherwood. Mm -hmm. And you're doing something from also uh, a classic, they call it a classic, Flowers of... Flowers from, for Algernon. Flowers for Al that, uh, Algernon. And they say that's an American classic. How? Well, I, I don't know how, but I remember when I was in high school in the late 60s, uh, I think the book came out then, or maybe the book was even older. Who's but the, the author? Film, I can't remember the Trigger. author of the book. But everyone remembers the movie Charlie with Cliff Robertson oh, that was in it. the late 60s. It was based on that. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a, quite a profound story about a young man who, in those days we called him retarded, politically correct. These days we use other, we call him intellectually um, challenged or something. Oh, that's... And, and he gets the surgery, and he becomes a genius, his life changes, and then continues to change. And that's on the stage right now? 
with the Deaf West Theater. Yes, tell me about that. Well, that's an amazing group. They sent that play to Broadway, Big River, a few years oh, ago. Oh, right. Deaf West produces once or twice a year. They do uh, fully realized productions with, uh, they integrate speaking actors and non-hearing, non-speaking actors. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you sign? I don't sign, but about half our, uh, about half our cast are do not speak or hear and sign only. Uh, several members of our cast speak and sign, so they're um, simul, like simulcast. Can you understand role. everything if well, I, in if the audience? If can you understand? A, if you don't know sign language, it's awfully hard. It's beautiful to watch, but at the same time, someone is signing, someone is also voicing. Oh, so I I'm see. playing, uh, the director has taken a cast of 30 wow. and reduced it to a group a ensemble of 14. So we're all playing two or three roles. Oh, uh, and who's and the I director? Play Matthew McRae. So how do so you? So I'm playing work? two roles. You're playing a doctor, right? I'm playing a doctor, the one of the, the head surg the head uh, theorist who had this idea of doing surgery to increase intelligence, and I also play Charlie's father in flashback scenes. So ah. I speak and play both those roles. I also speak for my colleague director Charles Katz who plays the, uh, the surgeon in the play. Whenever he signs, I speak his part. But how do you know? You've just learned well, the we've, part? Well, we've learned you know, in rehearsal. You've learned the part, yeah, so you can't look, watch him. And he's signing what the script says. Right. Yes, but my <laughs> voicing of his signing has to be in sync. So I have to kind of know what he's saying when he's saying it, so that as I finish speaking, he finishes signing at the same time. How long did it take to rehearse? Was it extra long with this kind of uh, Well, it was a normal rehearsal process, but uh, Matthew's a very efficient director, and he had it all mapped out before we started, and we made most of those five weeks of time, and we got it on. What does he come to you with, Matthew, the director? What does he bring? Because he's got to be dealing with all these other issues. Right. Is he a hearing director? Uh, Mike uh, Matthew is a hearing director who has had some experience with signing. I he see. knows some ASL from previous workshops he's done. I see. So he was able to c to communicate to both casts. But most of the time, we would have a oh, interpreter. He... There was always an interpreter on duty, because when Matt is giving his direction, um, those of us who hear can hear what he says but those who can't hear uh, are being Somebody's, signed. I see. So it's, it was an amazing uh, kind of process to integrate that all. Can they, can they take this somewhere else? Does it seem like it would go somewhere else? Listen, it's no different than any other play. If, if the right people like it and the right people with money come along, they could go somewhere else. Uh, Deaf West has taken place to Broadway and they have in the past had associations with the Center Theater Group oh, wow. and brought plays to either the Kirk Douglas or to the, the Mark Taper Forum. So uh, there's every possibility. What about the costuming? Is there costuming involved? Well, of course, costuming and lighting. This play is mostly unique, I think, for its multimedia aspects. Oh, that tell us about um, that. Not only are we signing but there are subtitles that, so there's a lot of projections. Some of the flashbacks are done by video projections. So the audience can understand from? From either hearing. Uh -huh, or seeing, or um, seeing subtitle. subtitles. And the subtitles help, uh, the oh. he help the hearing actors when there's no speaking on stage. Can they see it too? And the subtitles <laughs> help the, s the deaf actors when there's no signing on stage. So he's really mishmashed uh, all the possibilities of communication. But anyone who is uh, deaf but understands ASL, American Sign Language, right. can watch the play from beginning to end and get everything. And anyone who is not familiar with ASL, a normal, oh, uh, you know, un right. unhandicapped person, right. can uh, get the whole play because they will be able to hear or read everything that's and, going and on. And what does your doctor character do? Uh, my doctor is a psychologist who has come up with an idea of if we can find the right portion of the brain that can be removed and we find the right way to stimulate the remaining brain tissue to we can stimulate brain protein growth in a super normal rate then we can take someone who is uh, with an IQ of less than 68 which is what he which was? is what Charlie was and turn him into a genius of an IQ over 150 and the actor, Daniel Durant, who plays this role, uh, he's a non-speaking actor, oh, yes. and he's the central role, 
is, uh, is amazing in his depiction of this character and the transformation from a very slow-witted but likable fellow into um, an arrogant, self-centered brainiac. Really? And then uh, that journey continues. Uh, I don't want to give away the rest of the story. You talk about it that it was a film. Yes. Right? When you're acting in something like this and the rest of the cast, do you see the film or do you do your research yourself, do your reading yourself? Uh, a lot of us read the book. Or the book, The right. original source right. material. Right. I'm curious to see the movie after all these years, but um, I but didn't you feel didn't it would be it. helpful at this point. I uh, but I'll probably look at it in the next couple of months. But after you've finished your... After we finish the run. Yeah. I wouldn't mind picking run. it up now. I mean, once we've... As, uh, at least for me, as an actor, once I've established my work and my point of view, of, uh, you know, I know what I'm doing in the play, I'm not going to alter it right. in any drastic way because I saw somebody's film performance. Yes. No, that's why I wondered how that influenced you. Um, you're teaching, you're on, on the stage. What if some other work comes along, like a TV show or a film? Can you work your schedule out for those it's a, it's a. We try to. It's a <laughs> dilemma for any actor working in Los Angeles because uh, most of us are um, subject to the whims of the industry right. and, you know, that paycheck, it, you yes, get paid you... for a TV show, that's that can pay your rent for the month. Right. So it's very hard to turn down that work and sometimes it can be a problem if they don't let you off the set by 7 p.m. and your curtain is at 8. <laughs> that happens. Does and it happen? It's not, it's not fun for all the people involved. Did, I was just wondering if, if when actors who are active in films and TV, um, if you have something in your contract that says uh, if, if a big role comes along, if you can break your contract. There are a lot of levels <laughs> of, of theatrical um, commitment. And if you're working in a full equity company at the Mark Taper or the Pasadena Playhouse or San Diego or La Jolla or one of these other places, yes. you basically you don't go on auditions for that period of time. You, you, I see. You, you, you respect yourself. that. You, re, you have to respect that. Kind. They're paying you real money. Right. In uh, the, what we call the equity waiver, the 99 seat the agreement theater, which is the bulk of the theater out here. You're working for seven dollars a night on your show, and which is basically car fare and maybe a ba cup of maybe. coffee, a bagel. Maybe. <laughs> and uh, everyone knows that um, it's just sort of understood that we hope these conflicts won't come up. I see. But you have to take the money. You have to take the. And they'll coffee. be understanding about it. Uh, they won't <laughs> be happy, but they'll try to be understanding. Play, the plays get closed often because an actor got oh. work and couldn't get off the set. Oh, 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 and also oh. in this level, we're, you're not working with understudies. So if someone oh, gets right. sick or is delayed out of town or something, you know, the show gets canceled. Oh. That's unpleasant for everyone. We don't like to do that. No. We don't like to do that here either. But Bruce, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. A pleasure <laughs> to be here with you. Thanks. And keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com and 777 South Figueroa. 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.